Hi, I'm Deanna Joe, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today, I have a very special guest with me who is going to share his story of leaving the UPCI and what led to that and kind of what his journey has looked like since then. And so I am pleased to welcome Andrew De La Rosa to the channel. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, thank you for having me. No problem. I'm glad you agreed to do this. So Andrew actually has a blog and a YouTube channel, and it is called Escaping 350 Utopia. And so I'll link that in the description and you can go and check that out. Let's jump right into it, Andrew. So we'll start right at the beginning. How did you get into the UPCI? Were you born in or did you did you join at some point? Um, I was born into it. Uh, my parents were converted. My my dad was in the Air Force. So when he was deployed in uh, Japan, he was reached out to UPCI min uh, missionaries out there at the air base where my dad was stationed. What was it like for you in, in your time in the UPCI? I mean, I know a lot of us who have left, we are vocal about the issues. But I mean, most of us had some good times when we were young and growing up. But just talk to me about what it was like for you, kind of the the good, the bad, the ugly, the the leadership roles maybe you were in and the rules. <laughs> yeah. So I had a different experience than a lot of people because um, I know for for uh, women in the UPC, it, it's a little bit more difficult because of the the amount of rules that are imposed on you and the implications, not just the rules themselves, but what they imply. Yeah. Um, so for me as a guy, you know, a lot of guys have this similar experience. There's not a lot that we have to worry about growing up. You know, we get a lot of liberties. We're not as scrutinized. And so, um, you know, I say, unfortunately, because I think there's a, a lot of things that are lost in that culture uh, in helping mature men. Um, you know, I have just like a normal experience. I wouldn't say I had a lot of issues with the church growing up. Well, and I mean, the only thing that guys really aren't allowed to do is wear shorts, which, you know, you're from Texas, so I could see how that would be a problem. But really, you know, you get to live a pretty normal childhood and teen years and yeah. you just go into church. It's a, it, it was a minor inconvenience, you know, and you get accustomed to it. Like, uh, it's so funny now that I see it all the time. The, the uniform for any athletic Pentecostal guy was like some, you know, like raggedy T-shirt and light pants, you know, the, yes. the like windbreaker material. Yeah, those tearaway um, type pants. Exactly. So you, that you had your workarounds. Um, mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, the absolute best, but it's something you could just easily tolerate. So, yeah, um, it didn't bother me too much. You were involved in leadership roles. How did that all come about and what what were you involved in? Uh, I might be jumping ahead on a couple of things, but I'll, I'll say that um, first I have to preempt that anything I'm saying, I'm not trying to have like a pity party on myself. It's just to give context to, you know, my background in the church. Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of like a, I, I use the word a lot, periphery individual like I wasn't really prominent or recognized very mm -hmm. reserved shy so I wasn't really um someone that people would have imagined would be involved in ministry at all yeah but it was, it was always kind of uh directed at other people that I grew up with some of my colleagues and friends they were always pegged as like this guy is going to be an evangelist a preacher uh and Andrew he's just supposed to be a faithful tithe member you know it's like he's <laughs> um so my my um my foot in the door into ministry was my dad signed me up when I was <clears throat> 13 years old, I think 13 or 14, to run sound ministry because they were looking for volunteers, right? It's one of the least volunteered positions in, in in the Pentecostal church. Like nobody wants to do media. So I signed up for it and they just put me in the rotation. That was the first kind of entryway because even at that level they still had the expectations of like, okay, this is a leadership role. So you have to adhere to standards. At this stage at our of our church, we didn't have a document we had to sign, but later we would. We'd have a document that like, you know, these are the expectations that we uh, expect of our leadership. 
So Okay, and I'm sure that had a lot more expectations for females who were involved in leadership than males. Yeah. Yeah. So the expectations that were eventually put on paper were already expected of us early on, if not even harsher, yeah. because it was always like shifting, right? Without a document, they could just, you know, like, well, I don't like the way you, um, you know, you wore your hair the other day. You know, that's <laughs> ungodly and your leadership, right? So that kind of put, um, I guess, a, a sort of set of infrastructure that that guided me in into ministry at, at, at a young age. It's a rotating ministry, like nobody stays in it for a long term. So you have, you know, it, it almost was like, you know, and this is just my opinion, uh, I, you know, I'm not claiming to to know anyone's thoughts, but uh, a lot of ministers would, would go into it as kind of like a holding position, right? Because you have to be involved in a ministry of some sort until, you know, you're elevated to an, a, a prominent, you know, position up front. And so a lot of our uh, preachers at, at our church, they would temporarily be a, in the sound booth for like a couple of months, maybe even a year or two. And then they would get elevated to like worship leader <laughs> on the rotation for preacher or evangelist, or they'd get moved on to like serving at other churches. So I, I brushed shoulders with a lot of people that uh, eventually went on to do other things in, in the UPCI. So I, I just kept doing it. Um, and into my teens, you know, I started feeling a little worn out about it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not a huge responsibility at that stage because I was just one of the people in the rotation. So I wasn't, there was one gentleman that was overseeing the sound ministry of all the technical parts. And this is where like a bigger role gets played in because this individual in the, eventually left, which was okay. starting a pattern of, of what a commonplace thing at our church was people would just leave. And so he left and I didn't know the context. Um, it apparently was pretty contentious, mm -hmm. um, but details were never given. You're just allowed to kind of come up with stuff in your own mind and imagine what, what happened. So he was the media director. And at this point, I think I was 17 years old and the pastor approached me and he, he, he asked me to come into his office and he tells me the story of, you know, he left and he want, he tried to damage this church. He tried to leave and he thinks we're not going to be able to function without him. But that's not true. You know, Brother Andrew, is it? He's <laughs> like, so I'm asking, do you think you could take over this role? And I'm a young, impressionable, you know, 17 year old. I, I uh, Going back to my backstory, I was I guess you could characterize me as like a goody two shoes, like <laughs> I, uh, teacher's pet. That, that was my upbringing. I, 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 no one would have ever expected anything of me. I would always get voted in as like the shyest person in the classroom. Um, I did well academically, and that's not to pat myself on the back, just that's the person mm -hmm. that I was supposed to be, you know? So yeah. I went to Christian schools. You know, my parents enrolled me in Christian mm -hmm. schools, two Pentecostal Christian schools and then one Baptist. And they had these awards called um, Christian Character Awards at the end of the year. And I won them like every year, you know, I have a whole bunch of trophies in my, at my parents' house. So that just characterizes me leading up to the 17 year old now being told, Hey, I need you to take over this ministry. It's crucial. We need someone to take this on. And so of course I said, yes. Right. I felt like this is God's calling in my life. Like why else would he put me in the sound ministry and to learn all these years leading me up to this moment to like take over and, um, I look back now and I, I realize how so underprepared I was because there was no manual, no guidebook, nobody telling you what to do. It's just literally like, here's our old infrastructure of a church yeah. with tables littered everywhere, you know, under floorboards and, you know, old, you know, we had like really old technology mm -hmm. right? and they're like, just figure it out. 17 year old, you know, and, <laughs> try not to electrocute yourself. <laughs> And, and thankfully, you know, um, we had a, a, an associate pastor. He wasn't the associate pastor at the time, but he took a really uh, pivotal role at this church where he did a lot of those things. And so he basically, if it was not for him, I would have been crushed under that responsibility mm -hmm. for years because um, he was the one like he was, a, a. I think, before he went into full time ministry, he was like a pipe fitter, very accustomed like to handyman kind of stuff, which I wasn't, you know, so it helped 
me through the process of becoming the media director for all those years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your cat just hit yeah. the window. There's something going on out there. <laughs> yeah, Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So you had mentioned before that you basically grew up in a military home and that probably contributed to you just being a kid who, you know, you were unproblematic, you followed the rules, you did what you were supposed to do. I'm sure that contributed and that really would play well into the way some UPC churches are run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at 17, anything they'd have asked you to do, you'd have been agreeable. Absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, I hadn't even really thought about that aspect of, you know, being in a military room because we we lived in a couple of different places leading up to um, being uh, in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And when you're moving often, yeah, you know, that's how you get along. At least, you know, my personality type is you, you learn to become agreeable, a people pleaser, Mm -hmm. And you start to look for the affirmation of authority figures. And so the UPCI, I think, takes advantage of that um, because those are the types of individuals they want to construct is people pleasers that that don't question. And uh, so you're perfect prey, I feel, in, in those sorts of authoritarian structures where like, OK, this person is agreeable. They're impressionable, uh, especially when you're young. Right. And there's a lot of things that can be asked of you. And so that all contributed to me to to essentially being like a really perfect target to be used. Yeah. And so you did this, uh, you did the sound room thing and the media, it, it kind of grew beyond the sound room to church media. Yeah. I mean, this was happening during a time where technology was shifting <clears throat> for the church for a lot of churches. So I think a lot of churches were starting to develop their technology, incorpor incorporating it into services. Right. So I think this is around the time when the church is starting to like uh, debate the uh, like the Hillsongification of of the UPCI. Yeah. Right, so the churches are taking their stances. So like it, it's very slow going for a lot of churches, especially the most conservative of them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what was happening at our church, where there were like no LED lights, you know no fog machines, right? Like these are the things we're rejecting because it's it's definitely going to stifle the 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 spirit. Yes, the delicate spirit that gets stifled so easily by so many things that the pastor doesn't like. Right. Um, I guess maybe I'm going to jump back a little bit. At what point did you feel like you became a Christian? Like I know some people have a hard time putting a finger on it because, you know, you just grow up in the church and you just kind of probably stage by stage kind of morph into faith and you know as you can understand and then other people have this moment where they can just point to it and be like that was it that was that was when I became a Christian for you when would you say it was uh I think it happened very young I think um I have like uh individual memories that I can kind of draw on that remind me of being like, oh, okay, this is I this is what makes me a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned to develop it over the years. And I'm just, and now that I'm out of the UPC, I, I'm developing it even more so than I ever have in my lifetime. But I remember growing up in my first church in Louisiana, they had what was called Vacation Bible School. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with that. And uh, I remember having many moments. And, and one of the first ones, I can't even pin the year, you know, I was so young. I think I was baptized at seven and around the same time, they, my parents tell me I received the Holy Ghost. So I don't remember that, but the, the, around that time frame is when I remember feeling like this is what it means to be Christian, tying it to the mainstream principles of Christianity, of like being sweet, kind, forgiving, merciful, Right. Yeah, the yeah. the general qualities that like kind of broadly all Christians agree upon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's when I felt that. And plus, I was getting the affirmation from leadership, you know, Sunday school teachers, you know, children's church workers are like, wow, you're, you're you're a really good kid. And so that kind of reinforced that idea like, wow, I good kid equals good Christian. I'm a Christian. Yeah. And it kept me going down that path. So, you know, I'm in Sunday school, I was raising my hand, answering the questions, you know. So it started for me early, I would say. And then I would say when I felt 
Pentecostal, I guess, <laughs> was in my teens, and this is at uh, youth camps. I think I was probably around 15, 16 years old and uh, had this moment in the altar call um, after, you know, they always highlighted the um, the last service of yeah. these week-long <laughs> youth camps. The last service is the most, you know, uh, it, it, it just, it, everyone looks forward to it for some reason, and God's going to move the most at the last service. And of course, I felt the heightened excitement for it, Yeah, you know, and then in that last service, they had their last altar call, and, and I was just weeping, bawling my eyes out. And I, I think that's when I connected the general concept of Christianity, those principles of being, you know, sweet, kind, mm -hmm. merciful, all that. So now it's it's about the emotional aspect of things. Yeah. You know, being emotional, um, the speaking in tongues. Um, so it really solidified it for me there. And there was a whole culture that surrounded that. I didn't recognize at the time. I do now. You know, the whole like using it, the what kind of irks me now is, you know, I got caught up in that culture of using like ambiguous language, like spiritual isms. And that's what you get addicted to as a, especially as a young person. And that's, that's what becomes Christianity for you, you know? So I think that's probably about the time that I was like hardcore, concrete, uh, apostolic Christian young man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, didn't look back for a long time. Was there ever a point where you can look back and remember being confronted with the gospel? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, um, this is all happening to me when I'm really young. I got confronted with the gospel, surprisingly. Um, so I said 15, 16, around the mm -hmm. time that I became like apostolic. In our, our Pentecostal Christian school at my church shut down. And it was just in low attendance. We managed to get down to like one room of just students, high school through middle school. So it was almost just like homeschool, but in, in a small room with different, like a few kid, different kids. So eventually they shut it down and there were limited Christian school options. And so the pastor at the time, he sent his son to a Baptist school that was nearby. How did I know this was where you were going with being confronted with the gospel? You had to go to a Baptist school. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it hit me, you know, front dead center because I'm looking at these kids you know granted there are there are bad kids right oh. and, and that's what I gravitated to her like oh this is why Baptists are bad because these bad kids right and it's yeah. like there's bad kids in as if Pentecostalism doesn't have bad kids you yeah. know yeah <laughs> but um yeah that's when I was confronted with the gospel because they would do um weekly so we we had morning devotion mm -hmm. that was the first thing we all did we ran it we went into the chapel and they they just made announcements and then quickly said a prayer and read a scripture. And then they'd always give an opportunity for anyone that wanted to come to Christ. Okay. And it, of course, coming from a Pentecostal background, and I'm I'm like, you know, I'm I'm wholeheartedly apostolic. I'm sneering. I'm in my mind, I'm thinking like these goof, you know, goofballs. They don't know. If only they knew, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh so I I for four years or yeah four years at right into high school when I started off, I was fighting that off every single week. They because on Wednesday they would have a chapel service and they'd have a, a Baptist preacher come and beautifully they'd always preach the the you know different aspects of Christian principles, Christian behavior. Um and then they'd always end it out with asking if anybody wanted to um receive Christ. Yeah. And so that's a lot to take in, you know, and then they have their own culture, you know, like mm -hmm. they're adopting. Uh, I remember we laugh about this now because it's kind of silly, but every once in a while in chapel, they would do um, they would just play movies, but they played the Christian movies. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you ever heard of the Love Comes Softly series. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's like 12 of them or something. <laughs> it's like so yeah, many. Quite a few. And so they would play those and um they're really sappy or whatever. But the one I remember the most was uh, Facing the Giants. We played it more than once. That's They were kind of obsessed because it's a, a football school. Okay. At the end, they had kind of like, I guess, an altar call. I don't know what Baptists call it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> probably. It was like a recommitment. 
so they asked like if you feel like you've strayed away from god um because i was not understanding how their their view of salvation was Mm -hmm. Um, so the way they viewed it was that like not that you lost your salvation but that you wanted to rededicate and recommit yourself to christ yeah and so they would come to the front and they didn't do you know like the wild stuff that we pentecostal did like you know shaking and vibrating and rolling and all that yeah they just just they just cried and they were on their knees and and just tearfully and it was just for a brief moment but like you can't deny that feeling you know I, even i was kind of taken aback by that like wow what am i experiencing what are they experiencing mm-hmm. and so i had to write that off like what what is this how can the Holy Spirit be here in a Baptist school? Right. Yeah. And um, it just never, es- it never escaped me. I-, I never even publicly expressed that to anybody that, that that was what I was struggling with for years, what I experienced in the Baptist school. Yeah. You experienced God. Yeah. Um, and I even kept, so they had a Bible course that they gave to the juniors and the seniors. And they had this textbook called The Inner Man. Mm -hmm. Very, it was really good. It was like a dictionary size book. And the whole time I was learning this course, I was like, man, I'm loving this about like integrity. It's about Christian character, but not a single instance of speaking in tongues. (laughs) And And the way I was taught at my church was that you don't get Christian character and integrity until you have the Holy Ghost. Right. The Holy Ghost puppeteers your body to be integrous but but then i saw that the, the you know there were genuine sincere people at this church or at the school that did portray christian traits so i was like well what what are they doing are they like pretending or like what <laughs> yeah. if i were just to hand this book to someone that wanted to be a genuine christian there's a lot of good principles you can draw from it that will help to guide and, and shape you as and disciple you as a christian and yeah. but again like everything was Anytime they mentioned the spirit, it was kind of generically, I think the way that the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, like they talk about walking in the spirit, they say you need to walk in the spirit. And this is what that looks like, as opposed to right the apostolic formula. It looked like the fruit of the spirit, whereas the apostolic thing was just this demonstrative. Yeah, that, that was kind of more the focus. Right. So I had to confront that. And I didn't have any a good answer for it for a long time. Mm-hmm. Just kind of set it aside. Yeah, I can see how that would be <laughs> a hard thing as a teenager to try to figure out. I even remember um, I have a lot of respect for this gentleman. He was my English teacher, and <clears throat> being a Christian school, they of, of course spiritual stuff comes up. Somebody had brought up. And I don't know if they knew I was apostolic. I mean, I've, I've probably told people I was in Pentecostal and, and they knew I wore pants only, which was a weird thing about me. Right. <laughs> um, some some lady said that she challenged me because she was trying to explain it to her son because she was a, her son attended the school as well. And she was like, well, they do that because they have a conviction. I'm like, what's a conviction? And she goes, well, conviction means that you're literally willing to die for your belief. And I was like. Do, am, am I willing to die over these pants? Like <laughs> that's how you're explaining it to me to to these people. And so uh, my English professor, uh, the gentleman, he he brought up or one of the girls in the class brought up like, how do we know if these clothes are meant for women and these clothes are meant for men? And he just like very easily and quickly like, all right, everyone, look at your t-shirt tag. What's it say? And um, she says, you know, female size, blah, blah, blah. And he, he looked at me. What's your say? You know, male size. Like, there you go. <laughs> he just, he wasn't getting into that. <laughs> yeah, just very quickly. But I, I, it made me think about it, you know, because I was like, okay, well, you know, I understand. Like, we'll say not to get into the dress thing, because I, 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 that, that's a whole subject in of itself. But like, yeah, like, okay, girls are supposed to wear skirts dresses or whatever but what about t-shirts you know that's a modern thing they're literally sewn and you know put together the same exact way and sometimes they're interchangeable right um what makes how do you distinguish that those threads 
were designed for a female and one was designed for a man and it's literally the tag you know uh mm -hmm. or usage so um yeah again that threw me into a loop i remember that moment distinctly because of that so i'm surprised that your parents and that the pastor there were willing to send their kids to a Baptist school. I mean, they must have really had a big problem with public school because a lot of them would be nervous that something like this would happen. <laughs> your, kid, your kitty's acting up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think my parents were as concerned because they were more concerned about, like they were worried about bullying and, okay, yeah. you know, there were, I think in the early 2000s, there was the whole notion of like, you know, the drug issue of school and and then school shootings were becoming more prominent. So they felt like I was safer yeah. in a Christian school. I look back now, I don't know if my parents cared so much about doctrine that mm -hmm. that's why it wasn't an issue. Yeah. But as far as my church was concerned, uh, the rhetoric was that, um, excuse me, sorry, let me, hey. <laughs> Okay. Doesn't bother me. I'm a cat person. All the <laughs> shenanigans, I'm all here for it. <laughs> so their rhetoric was that um, there's no way we could be persuaded. They were so confident in their doctrine. They're like, that we're supposed to be a beacon of light in their church. Wow. That surprises me because most of the UPC churches I've been around are like very isolated and they isolate their people, it's almost like they're terrified that if they hear anything else, they'll be convinced. Well, this was a, a, a transitionary period because, so there was, there was the, the pastor that we came up under, mm -hmm. and then he gets, he gets superseded by the existing pastor now. Okay. This and that's when things kind of changed. So I think this was kind of like a necessary evil in their view, mm -hmm. because uh, obviously our church church school disseminated and, and it had like a rich history before I got to this church. I mean, they used to be a fully fledged big school and then dwindled down to like literally one classroom. So, when, so who did it dwindle under the previous pastor or the current one? The previous. Okay. So it kind of fizzled out by the time this pastor got there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole other story because the, the, the history of the church is its own like contentious story between mm -hmm. different individuals because the school was a, a pretty controversial thing when it happened because it came down to a vote and people were kind of hoping that the church would that like they could they could pull out of it they could become successful again and uh the 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 church voted it down you know it felt like it was a financial burden okay but um that's beside the point it, it just ended and the the few fragmented students that were going i mean like i said it was only a handful myself and a couple other people Right. They um they followed the pastor's son because he sent his son to this high school and we were all going from middle school to high school. Mm -hmm. Some of the other kids went home school. So the few of us that went, we just followed him because we felt like, okay, if the pastor's son can go there, then it's safe for us too. It's good enough for him. It's good enough for us. Right. <laughs> so you are being used in leadership at your church. You're, you know, you, you've, bought in you're you're firmly apostolic even though maybe had a few questions during your your baptist schooling yeah <laughs> what leads you to start to pull back or to question things and make consider even making changes so going back to my upbringing i think i always encapsulated christianity with the mainstream characteristics of christianity mm -hmm. Right. That's what I was aiming for internally was I was aiming to be recognized for being generous, being kind, all those qualities. Yeah. Um, and the apostolic aspect of it were kind of just like necessary functions that you can kind of carry out in the background. And as, as it started getting more prominent in my life, that's when I started having questions. So like uh, high school, when I, I started questioning tongues. But I was always too afraid to to explore um, different scholarship because we were always told that reading books was bad. Just flat out, like 
if you read other people's books, watch people's you know teachings, stuff like that, that's not good. You're being you know used a, a by the enemy. And we even had like teaching that said like reasoning is bad. Reasoning, okay. Yeah, like you're thinking too much. Stop thinking so much. You know, you're, you're trying to figure it out. And some of you guys are. I still remember this, the the sermons are like some of you guys. You're you're so smart, you know, and you're like an engineer trying to figure it out, but you can't figure God out, and so quit it. You know, it's like <laughs> uh, <laughs> they don't recognize the beauty in the journey. <laughs> it's, you know, right. Well, my view was. And this leads into that question of, you know, when did I start questioning? Well, it was kind of peppered throughout mm-hmm. my upbringing until it became more of an issue later in my 20s. But I would always have a second thought and then I would reason it. And there was this persistent thought that I had that would always just trail me forever. And it was like one that I literally had to shake off, mm-hmm. uh, which was that some moment I was reading the book of acts and i thought what if speaking in tongues was literally just used for like language translation like it was just a miraculous gift to allow the apostles to preach in different languages and nothing else like it was in acts chapter two right where they and course, proclaimed the gospel in actual languages i mean i never thought about that when i was when i was a teenager but when you read it that's what it is so yeah yeah and I always, I had never consulted any outside books at this point. It just was a natural thought. And I was like, no, no, that's that's from the enemy. That's from the devil. <laughs> right. Because I, I was trying to reconcile. I mean, me and my brother, we question a lot of stuff. He left the church. and But at the time, we were both pretty devout, me and my mm-hmm. older brother. And we would often have conversations about the nuances that no one talks about. Right. I remember talking about the way some people behave when they receive the Holy Ghost in Pentecostal circles. It's as if they've lost control. Yes. Right. So like, and people describe it that way. They describe it as like, you know, I don't even remember what happened. Right. Or we had several youth uh, camps where they would have to carry people out from the altar to their dorm room because they couldn't, quote unquote, stop speaking in tongues. Yeah, I've seen things like that too. Yeah, it's it was wild. And, and I'm thinking, are we like being possessed by God? Is that what, what's happening? Mm-hmm. And so me and my brother kind of comforted ourselves because uh, we, we read 1 Corinthians um, like between 12 and 14, chapters 12 and 14. I think 14 is the one that says that, yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 32, it says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, mm-hmm. right? And then translated in more normal language, it's you're you're in control of your faculties when you operate in the spirit. Yeah. Or in the gifts, quote unquote. At least that's what Paul was trying to convey, because you know, obviously the, the Corinthian church was kind of going wild. Yeah. I mean, his big thing was order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never heard that preached. And I hadn't either. So we were we're we're kind of coming up with these little workarounds to kind of make it make sense to us. Like, okay, well. They're wrong, but the pastor won't call them out because they don't want to stifle their authenticity. Don't want to hurt their feelings. Maybe don't want to offend them and drive them away. So they're maturing, right? Mm -hmm. They'll eventually get to our level where we can control it, snap in, snap out of speaking in tongues. And then you look at the affluent people in the church that just don't speak in tongues. And that bothered me because it's like once you get to a certain level, you're just holy by proxy like you just because you attend this church and if they're elevated the expectation is or what will at least be preached is oh they're they're practicing their holiness behind the scenes like you're not seeing it but you can't question it and that's kind of what we highlighted we we started recognizing like okay there is this is a pretty pretty obvious pattern Mm -hmm. right doctors lawyers business owners they're they're not expected but if you're you know not to not to say it with a negative connotation, but if you if you're less educated, yeah, they're gonna scrutinize you harder, call mm-hmm. you out in service, like brother so and so, you need to speak in tongues right now. And then they would just start, you know, convulsing, you know. And it's like I I I couldn't reconcile it for so many years. And it was just those moments, but they add up, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
So eventually you decided to leave. Talk about how that decision came about. Cause that's a big, that's a big decision to make. Yeah. Well, it was years long. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will say in my twenties, the church kind of shifted. And this is when we started having really serious questions because up until this point, it wasn't very demanding per se in that like you could just at whatever degree you wanted to jump into the stream of apostolicism, yeah. no one would judge you until you get to that. Like there's like a core level of that stream. And so I was kind of like passively, like from the top down diving into that until I got into the core. And that's when I started seeing the problems. Yeah. Um, because and then it be does become burdensome and your salvation is tied to your performance. And so that's what I started seeing in my twenties because, um, I start getting involved in youth ministry. Mm -hmm. So this is the only time I've ever asked deliberately to serve in a, in, a, in a role was when my, the youth pastor who eventually became the associate pastor, he asked me, do you want to serve as a youth staff? Which is like, it's an ancillary position, right? You're just kind of like corralling kids from the back and yeah. helping stack chairs and stuff. Right. So nothing big. And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll do that. But me and my brother, we became more prominent and because we started doing more roles, becoming more um, leaned upon. Mm -hmm. and, and we were like so excited and interested to do all this, the, the stuff that was new. And um, like we made a, a, a series of youth movies uh, for um, to document our youth camps that we started doing on our own. OK. And I mean, we went full production. <laughs> like we had scripts and got all these equipment. And to this day, we have these little DVD cased uh, videos and did the artwork for it. We're, so we're very proud of that. And that was something that was our initiative. We, we presented it and we did the hard work and labor of, of making it happen. So that was us getting involved. Um, but as we got involved in youth ministry, we started seeing the holes because now you have to explain how you, why you behave the way you do and what, what you believe to young people. Yeah. Who have good questions. Yeah. And I had the same questions. <laughs> You're like, you know, and question? I, I don't know. <laughs> I never got answers. And so what really happened was they had split the youth group into senior high and junior high. Mm -hmm. And they had this couple, which we were good friends uh, uh, with, that they they set over the junior high ministry, and it was a new initiative. So very exciting for the church, right? We're we're finally fine tuning ministries for the their, their deliberate age groups. And um, one year into it, something happens, and it just turned into this scandal where they get stepped down, their family gets ostracized, and they just leave. Hmm. And we were kind of like the second in command, my wife and I, for that youth ministry. Great. And, and again, this is like a new initiative. So like we, no one knows what's going on. There's no guidebook, nothing. And so when they leave, literally the day it happened, it was it was a Friday night when we were going to have a youth service. The associate pastor called us in and they said, well, we've had to sit them down. We don't want this ministry to stop. Will you guys step in to be the new youth pastor? And again, it kind of put me in that position of like when I was 17, mm -hmm. where you feel like, wow, especially because at this time, I guess I sort of was having a pity party about myself. Like, you know, God, I I'm never called out to be in the forefront of anything. Right. I'm always the side character to everybody's ministry. And I felt like, wow, this is this must be God making way for me to finally serve in a ministry without knowing the details of how. Uh, caustic that separation was i later learned and uh i regret that i didn't ask more you probably would never have heard the full truth anyway so yeah not not from leadership maybe if you'd ask the couple who left but that's a good way to get yourself in trouble right and that's kind of what happened was we just our our relationship just naturally subsided and they were doing it very maturely I, I have to applaud them that they they handled it very well and they they left and they started their life in in a different church and 
but I, I respected them from a distance because I could see them maturing and um, living life normally um, and almost envied them a little bit because of the, you know, the freedoms that they, they started to in, embrace. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, um, I become, me and my wife become pretty consumed with serving the junior high youth ministry because both her and I were kind of periphery characters. Nobody recognizes or cares about who we are. And I felt like this was a first opportunity to be the kind of minister that I needed when I was growing up. Yeah. And so my goal was, I'm going to put as much effort into this as I would expect my younger self participating. Someone mm -hmm. that could answer the questions, someone that could put together a fully fledged understanding of the doctrine. And so <clears> that <throat> when they left my ministry, they would be so sure of the apostolic doctrine. <laughs> That's a surefire way to... <laughs> Leave the UPC. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly what happened. Because during the seven years of us serving, we had zero oversight. Really? I remember telling our youth staff at the time, we need to do this in, in a way that if the pastor ever comes in, he wouldn't be disappointed. He would he would be impressed. And um, anytime we teach, we need to make sure that we're in line with doctrine and so that if he ever sneaks in, we were always anticipating that he was going to come in and, you know, watch us or critique us or talk up, have a meetings with us. And after like year two, we realized he's never coming and he never did for seven years. We never once sat down and he asked me about what I was teaching them. Um, the associate pastor was more concerned, but they trusted me wholeheartedly because again, like growing up, I, I had the persona of being like, you know, he's the Bible kid. He he knows scripture. He was a Bible quizzer, Christian character guy. Agreeable. Um, agreeable. Like for sure he's teaching good stuff, right? Like and, yeah. and I remember being consulted by by other teens my age, like about questions about the Bible, me being mm -hmm. a teenager. So this is the guy that they put in, they just fully trusted I would do okay. Yeah. And we elevated it. You know, again, I know that, you know, people will probably hear that and like, oh, Andrew's so proud. Uh, but I'm proud of the work that we did. Yeah. We developed a team. We developed a, a different way to approach services, you know, because I, I couldn't sing or do any worship and we lost worship people. So we just turned it into this whole different laid back atmosphere. We had a student leadership team that we developed and, and I created curriculum and graphics for it and um, and I was studying intently, mm -hmm. um, making sure. Uh, but for the first few years, it was all just Christian character. Yeah. I was focusing on that and um, how we're supposed to behave. And then I would pepper in like altar calls and the Holy Ghost kind of experience. But it was mostly Christian character. And then towards the end, my mom was a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And she started getting having health issues and she asked me to step in to help her with Sunday school, which was for the same demographic. It was for junior high students. So they already knew me. Right. So it just seemed natural that I would just do the Sunday school class. Well, the other lady that was working with her, I guess she was burnt out and ready to leave herself. So as soon as I came in, she was gone. She was just like, <laughs> it's yours now, buddy. You know? Yeah. So here I am. You know, I'm trying to develop the media de de um, department in the 21st century, mm -hmm. you know, like literally evolving out of cassette tapes into YouTube. OK. Um, with all the problems that that comes with, because there's so many expectations that came out of that. Simultaneously, I was overseeing the junior high youth group, the student leadership group within it, its own respective media department mm -hmm. uh, and teaching and creating um, curriculum and discipling the staff, right? And turned myself into a mini pastor. Mm -hmm. And um, and then now I'm doing Sunday school and it, I try to make it more academic for Sunday school. Like, okay, well now we're just gonna cover Bible history. We're gonna cover how to read the Bible for their age group, you know, not like going over their heads and talking right. about like, you know. And 
I started seeing so many holes. I was like, there's not a lot of books out for this content. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of uh, scholarship on speaking in tongues. And that's when I got to start questioning harder because now it's on me. I'm the adult. Right. That was Kids were asking questions. And what ended up happening was as I started like searching for content, I would more find the counter arguments than I could find arguments for. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And uh, I had a distinct moment and I'm embarrassed, but I share the story because it was the weirdest experience I had in my life. But I, I found a blog and I can't even remember the blog because I found so many blogs since then, but it was the most rudimentary website, just like generic HTML, real simple. I think my light died. Sorry. And um, it talked about that thought I had years ago about mm -hmm. just literally being language translation. And I slammed my laptop shut and I shook it off. I was like, no, no, like, God, no, this is evil. This is sin. And it never, it, I never went back after that. I could never. And I thought, and I was embarrassed that I did that. I was like, why did I do that? And sure enough, I, I bought all of Bernard's books, tried to <laughs> try to make sense of it, his roundabout logic and you know circular reasoning. Yeah. <clears throat> I was like, is there anything, anything out there? And nothing. All the sermons were all about don't trust your logic. You're thinking too hard about it. Mm -hmm. um, if you think too hard about it, you'll lose out and the enemy will deceive you. Right. Uh, that's not that's not good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And so I started reading the critics. Yeah, the truth should be able to stand up to questions. Right. And that's exactly what I said to myself and to my wife. I said, we shouldn't be fearful. If what's correct, if, if what we believe is correct, mm -hmm. it will stand to scrutiny. And yeah. um, I use the analogy of like, you know, if one plus one equals two, you can go, you know, universally across the the globe and go to any school and that would not be contested. Right. right. And that's the rubric. Mm -hmm. you know, you, if a school teaches otherwise, no, oh, this God. is universally <laughs> accepted. Yeah. So I thought that's what would happen when I study apostolic doctrine. Is that would that would be returned. And it, of course, it didn't. I ran into too many dead ends and then I started reading the critics and then. This makes more sense. Right. Yes. And um, what it really came down to was we started thinking, well, it it's not terrible. And, and this is at this time, we're not under fully understanding the ramifications of what like holiness standards do to mm -hmm. your meant your 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 mind, the implications of purity culture. You know, yeah. we're not understanding that we're still thinking, OK, well, if we participate in pentecostalism what's the harm we're still good people you know we're christians you still go, you go to the potluck you have your community yeah so we kind of contemplate the idea of like well we have trouble with the doctrine but you know what's the harm and um i guess god really wanted to push us out of it because and, and i think it in, in my opinion is a natural consequence of the of the doctrine is eventually it all it collapses mm -hmm. um that's why that's why apostolic doctrine ca can be dangerous because eventually if it's lived out to fr its fruition it ends up in these bad behaviors which is what we experienced our church started diverting into this really strange pathway that it made it hard to to continue that standpoint of like well it's innocent you know Harmless, we can just, yeah it's harmless. Now it's becoming harmful because they're attacking people, mm -hmm. claiming God's mercy has run out for them, um, putting spiritual death threats through tongues. That really made me question tongues because then the, the tongues of interpretation is what, what really kind of shot us out. Yes. And your church had a weird <laughs> phenomenon that continues to this day. Talk about that what really kind of let us out was the, the, the emergence of what would, would become the handmaiden is what they called yes. it. 
Um, I had a dream last night, and we I was in, I was here, you know, sometimes you know you're somewhere, but it looks a little bit different. There was no meaning in that, but I was here. I knew I was here. Bishop was up here uh, speaking. I felt like it was not a regular church service. I felt like it was like a funeral or something. Um, that wasn't, I don't, I didn't feel like that was a part of the dream, like someone's going to die or, you know, I didn't feel like that was uh, the point of the dream. But as I was sitting, I, I, I looked over and I could see a group of people come in and I'm not going to say who it was. I recognized two of them and I turned away quickly because I just, I didn't even want to acknowledge that they came in and they were people that left or I'm sorry, I need to correct myself. Um, those were people that God removed from this body. Um, they did not leave God kicked, kicked them out and, um, they walked their happy little self and they sat over here and I was doing something and it was as if I felt like the first time I spoke this, I was, it was myself, but I, it was like God gave me his thoughts. He, he, I knew the thought of God and I spoke it out and I said, get out of my sanctuary. And then God came upon me and I, and the Lord used me and, and over and over. And he used me to speak, get out of my sanctuary. And I couldn't, the Lord didn't lift it. It just repeated over and over and over. He would not stop until they left and they did leave. They got up and they got out, but they left. And I feel to kind of echo something that prophetess said, gone are the days of you thinking you can walk in here, your happy little self on your own accord, because maybe it's a different uh, thing happening in this sanctuary. If it's a funeral, gone are the days of you thinking you have any right to step in this place. If you have been cut off from the Lord, if you have been cut off, you have no right to step in this house. Don't do it. Don't cross him because he'll call you out and he'll move on a vessel and he won't stop until you get up and get out of here. God are the days of the Lord putting up with you, thinking you can yield to a spirit of the enemy and sit your happy self down and send a message to the man of God. God is calling you out right now. Don't do it. It will not happen again. And if you do, you will get out. You want to show God is going to speak to you and send you out. Don't do it. Get your mouth off. Just shut up. You're lost already. Just shut your mouth. So they had this young lady at this church in whom I served in youth ministry with. You know, we were good friends with them. Mm -hmm. um, shared a lot of interest. Went out to lunch and dinner with them. Very lovely couple. And we enjoyed their company. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, she was involved in music ministry. And she got a lot of comparisons to... Um, I can't remember, like a prominent like Hillsong uh, vocalist. Darlene Check is about the only one I know. I think that's the name. <laughs> okay. But like that that archetype, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, like she had the potential to be like a lead vocalist, guitar playing, you know. And, and in Pentecost, that was big, right? Like you want to highlight these kind of people. Right. She was good at it. She she was a very good singer, very charismatic. Like people really liked her personality. And so that's where everyone thought that she was going. And the pastor one day, you know, I'm sure he built up to this, but what we saw is in one service, he, he called her out and he said, you know what, that's not your gifting anymore. And he told her, you're going to be um, involved in another gift, but you will no longer sing after this and just shut her down. And I remember she was weeping, bawling her eyes out like, as you, as one could imagine, right? Yeah. Lifelong goal. It's odd that he didn't think that two gifts could coexist. Right. <laughs> it just has to be the one. Yeah. And that started uh, a path of what I would say is psychological conditioning. Yeah. You know, withdrawing something from someone and imposing yourself as the, as the answer. Mm -hmm. as the one to to give solace and to give affirmation and so he created this relationship wherein she would seek out his affirmation and eventually it developed into the tongues of interpretation
And um, we yeah. witnessed this from the inception to what it is now. Um, because most tongues of interpretation up to this point, they were very sparse. I think in yeah. most Pentecostal churches, is, this is the case. It's like it happens every once in a while. Yeah. And they're usually pretty innocent and ambiguous. Yes. Yeah. Well, hers started off that way. But as he as she became more um, conditioned, she would he would start to praise her when it started leaning towards him. So now you are very um, kind in your presentation of his approach to this. I'm going to come right out and call it grooming. He yeah. groomed her to become what she has become today. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and and you can literally see played out, or at least my wife and I, we can literally see played out the, the grooming process. Mm -hmm. And that he's done it with other females at the church. Okay. Um, he's, for some reason, this gift is relegated to young women only. Not Not ever young men. There's one, I mean, occasionally there's a, there's like one or two guys that he'll permit yeah. to do it, but he, he highlights to the extent that he gives them like titles okay. and praises them. And so the handmaiden was one where he felt like God told him that that's your, that's your title. You know? Okay. So this is like an actual thing she's called. Cause I thought that was just something people from the outside. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, unironically, that's what he called her. He's the oh. one that came up with the name. And we thought, like, well, this is he not like thinking about the like implications of what that that name suggests, you know, especially mm -hmm. with like, that TV series that just recently came out, you know? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And she she accepted it. But like you could see from service to service the amount of like praise that people get when they align with the pastor mm -hmm. and you kind of get addicted to it. And I think that's what happened with her was she started craving like uh, to, to have him affirm her. Yeah. And so it became this thing where everybody started seeking out this gift. Like everybody just started spontaneously speaking in tongues and he had to control it. And so the way he controlled it was he developed this method. And again, this is my opinion, but I think if you look at the evidence, it's, it's pretty, plane um where he would run the microphone to whomever started speaking in tongues and so if you were to sample any of their services now you can see this it, it happens routinely three or four times a service and it takes him to distinguish who's the one speaking in tongues genuinely right so if someone starts loudly going off in tongues and he doesn't you know trust their intuition they just get left out in the wind to speak to the tongues to nobody um so it the system narrowed down who he approved. Yeah. Um, so if you didn't get a, 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 a microphone rushed to you, it's not your gift. Um, but if you did get one rushed to you, it was like, I'm sure it's like a rush of emotions and adrenaline. Okay, let's see. But don't hold. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. We got to go ahead. Right here, what you're feeling is correct, but I heard it first. This is good. Let me stop doing the teaching. Take it over to her. Now, you know what you feel. Look at me. You know what you feel is correct. It's man, for the Holy Ghost. It is my responsibility when people use in the gifts. We have two going, and I heard that one first, but you're right. You hear me? What you feel was correct. This is my responsibility. Go ahead. Just stick that mic up there and let it go. That whole charade, this psychological manipulation yeah. of the whole church, we were kind of piecing it together because it, it wasn't as, we didn't know how to label what we were seeing yet. Well, <clears throat> it's unusual. I mean... <laughs> I can see how you really wouldn't know how to process it in the beginning. Right. And uh, that's when I started um, consulting scripture because I felt like, I mean, there's a, there's a dozen different times where the pastor was using this gift to basically push people out of his church. Mm. And he had gotten pretty good with it, a very sophisticated system, because like there was a guy that 
was well respected at our church um and very charismatic um and people were starting to gravitate to his ministry almost as if like a, a sort of sub pastor yeah people seeking him out his teachings he had a special prayer meeting that he created and it developed from like one individual to like multiple people coming separately and i guess you know that must have rubbed the pastor the wrong way and for like months tongues kept coming out and saying mercy has ended for you get right with god or you know your time on earth might be done right oh my goodness different iterations of that over and over again like god's mercy kept on getting pushed forward right like okay you have one more week and then god was like <laughs> god, so merciful he'll give you one more month and i thought scripture there has to be scripture that stipulates how how this gift behaves mm -hmm. ergo i go to first corinthians and that's when i first start seeing all the different flaws and i was like okay i can't even if i were to accept tongues of interpretation is a thing Mm -hmm. Right, which at this stage of my, you know, biblical studies, I don't believe it is. But so you lean cessationist? Yeah, I, I guess I'd say I'm probably more cessationist. Uh, mm -hmm. But me and my wife, we we say we're cautious continuationists. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. Because I, I guess what I feel tongues is is one thing. There's no public versus private tongues. Speaking in tongues for the purpose of promulgating the gospel in a different language yeah like very nonchalant like i would expect that like if if i was in a portuguese setting and i didn't know portuguese god would miraculously give me the gift of portuguese for that moment to preach a gospel and then go yeah that's how i imagine it happened for the the original um you know missionaries and so you think like the tongues and interpretation thing would be and I'm I'm asking, would be more like, say there's a Portuguese couple in an English speaking church. And so this message comes in Portuguese to share the gospel with them. But the purpose of the interpretation is so everybody can know what's being said. Right. OK. Right. And I think that's what Corinthians stipulates. Right. Like that the the rule is that it should edify the whole body. Yeah. Right. And so that's what we started realizing, like, OK, we'll give them the argument that private and public tongues are a thing and that mm -hmm. the public tongues where one person speaks to speak to individuals, it should edify the body. And yeah. most times it did because it would be like, you know, those who are hurting, you know, peace is on the way. And you're like, yay, you know, it's like everyone's excited. Yeah. But now it's like you you know who you are. Mercy is over. It's like, okay, that's one person and it's not edifying. Right. right. It's, it's yeah. a negative connotation. And then it started reinforcing the pastor, like, listen to the pastor, obey him. Some of you are questioning. <laughs> I've heard some of those obey the pastor ones from the handmaiden specifically. I say I've been watching you and you are not passing the test that I am putting you through. And so I have moved on your shepherd this night for you. I say, what an example you have before you. I say, there is not another example I can give you. I say, hear what he speaks this night from his heart unto you. I say, he has been through things that only him and I know of. And I say his heart has been made right in my sight. And I say glean from this man before you. I say you question his integrity. But I say I have displayed it before you this night. I say do you trust me? I say if you say yes, then do you trust the man of God I've put over you? And if you say no, then you don't trust me. And, you know, you're getting taught, right? Like if he endorses one person doing it, mm -hmm. then you, you know, subconsciously other people that perform the, the, the tongue, they might genuinely believe they're speaking through or God is speaking through them. Oh, I think a lot of them do. Yeah, I yeah. think so. But they've been conditioned because the pastor, like afterwards, he just lavishes on them, like, oh, what a wonderful 
Mm -hmm. songs you perform how accurate and beautiful it was right yeah and so everyone kind of just compounds on top of that and um they just started attacking people pushing people out of the church uh contradicting scripture we were starting to take them down you know my wife and i because it became this weird phenomenon where people would record it on their phones so imagine being in a sanctuary in a dimly lit like prayer setting Mm -hmm. And someone just, you know, shouts out like, ah, you know, and then all of a sudden you see these phones flip out and lights, lights, boop, 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 all across the sanctuary. Everyone starts recording it. And I was like, this is dangerous, actually. This is not good because now we're elevating this to like almost scripture. Yeah. And um, but when we started recording it and going back and trying to my my reasoning was that these were only permissible if they if they could be tied to some scripture right or else why would god do it right like why would he speak outside of the scriptures yeah you know and and um uh, yeah time and time again we just notate okay this violates this scripture this violates that scripture and my wife were like this is bad this is dangerous um and it got progressively worse and as i studied corinthians it led me out of the UPCI altogether because I was like, it's clear. Like the scripture even says like, will they not think you are barbarians when you do yeah. this together collectively in a church? And it's like, that's literally what we're told, you know, like they were proud of it. Like, Oh, y'all think I'm crazy. And I lost my mind, but I lost my mind for Jesus. And then everyone just start like, you know, going uh, crazy. Across the floor. <laughs> yes. It's <laughs> like they celebrate the lack of order they have. And Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I've seen situations like that before, too. And just once you realize the order aspect of things, it just sounds so awful. Yeah. Especially when, you know, it, a lot of times there, I, I'm cautious to say it, but I think there are positive things that come out of those movements mm -hmm. um and because I, I don't write these people off i think a lot of people are sincere and genuine and good and too. loving people yeah people i love that that hate me i love them and yeah. i think Same. Of them still. yeah but um when you fully practice it out without scriptural guidelines it mm -hmm. leads to bad behaviors and we started noticing that in our lives and, and now we're like analyzing everything right like how you even handle emotional situations it's like you know we felt like that tongues was a was a uh emotional psychological crutch for people mm -hmm. because of the um it was almost like a form of trance uh, self meditation yeah self-soothing yeah they were self-soothing right like so you you have some trauma in your life you don't express it openly because you're not in a culture where you can talk about those things openly and so you have an altar call where you can cry out, mm -hmm. scream, shout, and lose your mind in in that trance state. Yeah. Right. And you know that's that's sort of parallel to some ways that psychologists and um, therapists will help you kind of come out of those uh, to to help deal with that trauma. Mm -hmm. you know, the whole like, here I'm going to give you this foam bat, and you can beat this pillow. <laughs> you know, tell yeah. your feelings of how you feel about you know your your abusive father and then you just you mm -hmm. know and it's it, it works right so there's some like psychological ties that you can pour that um put to that and then you realize that's unhealthy to constantly lean on that thing and then you you label it the holy ghost yeah to spiritualize it so that's my opinion of it now and then we started seeing it in our parents and we started seeing it in our family and and friends that were in it like they don't deal with their trauma they don't deal with their emotions correctly and and they use the holy ghost in terrible ways you know like to to justify um greed to justify their bad attitude like basically dismissing the fruits of the spirit and saying like you know well i just speak the truth you know because the holy ghost prompts me to speak the truth mm -hmm. even though it offends people yeah right uh they they leverage the Holy Ghost in, in, in those kinds of ways. And we started seeing it everywhere, you know, like people taking advantage of other people, lying and covering it up with the spirit. You know, the Lord told me that's the yeah. worst thing 
because I told my wife, I was like, the scripture tells us in um, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. And I re I recognized mm -hmm. that's what it means. Yeah. Not like bumping your toe and going, oh, you know, like, oh, God, I hurt my toe, you know, like, yeah, Jesus' name as an expletive. You know, you can make arguments for that. But what I feel the scripture is saying is don't say something God didn't say. Yeah, when I if I say to you, God told me if you send me seventy seven dollars that he is going to send you increase and meet your needs. And God didn't tell me that I have taken the Lord's name in vain. And if you turn on Christian television, it's everywhere. You go to churches. It's everywhere. You talk to saints. It's everywhere. This is something you and I really agree on because there are people who will quit jobs they don't like. And instead of just saying it was a toxic work environment, it didn't work for me. They'll say, well, I felt the Lord leading me elsewhere. It does become a crutch. It gets to the point where they can't do anything. They can't take responsibility for anything. They just spiritualize it all. It's just this over spiritualization of everything in their life. And I mean, so if I say, well, you know, God told me to quit my job, how are you going to have a problem with that, right? Even if it means that maybe our financial situation is going to become very difficult and I didn't think it through and all of this stuff, it's hard to argue with God. Right. And that's how we started seeing it used and then used by people we knew, but used in the pulpit. Yeah. And that's when it got dangerous. And so we... For years, we were contemplating, like, because it was while we recognized that it was wrong and mm -hmm. unbiblical, you know, we're, we're going through our journey of figuring this stuff out and reading all this material. And simultaneously, the deconstruction movement is happening. Right. Right. So um, I'm simultaneously trying to combat the deconstruction movement for the youth, but also right. dealing with it myself, you know. Right. Yeah. And um, it just became clearer and clearer the gift manipulation at the church was getting worse and worse and people were leaving. So we like, you know, me speaking out, it, I'm not the first one. Right. Within our district, they recognize that church is problematic. Yes. And you had <clears throat> privately shared a video of the pastor of that church just sort of talking about, he, he doesn't answer to anyone and he was almost dissing the UPC and he sort of dissed, <laughs> it sounded like he dissed David Bernard in it, basically that he wasn't answering to anybody. And so this is a problematic church within the organization, it sounds like. Yeah. But they don't want my voice to be heard. And so the enemy think when I'm hearing all of this, he want me to back up and to sit down and to, and to be quiet. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. It, it, the same thing they're trying to do to Donald Trump. I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, that they was gathering information on me. And they're gathering at headquarters, I am going to say it. And they're taking it to the chief person up there. Let me say this, I don't care. And they said that church is about to fall. And they're going to come in and take the church. Oh, yeah. And so they are sealing it because the authority that they got from the head. And they set a watch. But so they did with Jesus. I'm going to say, I don't care what authority. That authority don't override God, and they cannot stop it. By the organization, we have lifted that place in a place of the voice of God. Yeah, just like the dope. I mean, the who? <laughs> he can go in there and do it. He can shut him down. He can take his church. No, the only thing they can do is take my license. And license does not qualify you to be a minister of God. They, they want to squeeze me. I had a thought yesterday. They said you were saying some things and some things I had no idea were happening. And you said uh, they can't take this church. And I thought if they did, we'd all go with you. <laughs> wherever, wherever you go, we're following you just like sheep. So they think they're going to take a building and then we'll just, they can't take the church because we are the church. So no matter what, wherever our shepherd go, we go. So it's not even possible for you to take this church. There's a cup I, I'm, I have to drink because I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to follow man's structure. I'm only going to follow God's structure. And they can crucify me. They can talk about me. They can talk about this church. They can talk about the right hand. They can talk about the prophet, the prophetess. They can talk about the handmaid, the pastoral staff. They can talk about us all they want. That's just part of the price. We're not an occult. You have your leadership here, Seth, the pastoral staff, Justin. The Lord showed me something today, gave me words that some people have said. We're we going to look for a, a word. And, and there's people say, well, you know, we, we're in truth too. We, we don't do that, what you what y'all do over there. We we got a little bit more, uh, you, you know, we, we just don't live that way. Those people are not a messenger in your life. And we have people that just swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. 
What are you doing? I, I'm trying to make sure the flock is protected and you, you, you don't listen to any other voice other than the voice of God and the authority that God has put in your life. I mean, even within the churches in this area, mm -hmm. right? Because we have our own little small sections within. And what happened was, and, and this further solidified our decision because we're still involved in youth at this time, right? No oversight. So we're getting to teach the kids what we want. And, you know, we're trying to be genuine about it and authentic. And we want to make sure they're being taught everything. Um, well, they start withdrawing us from participating in the sectional and district events. Okay. So it was this slow kind of like boiling the frog in the pot kind of situation where they were like, we're not going to go to that youth rally just once, two, two youth rallies a year, you know, and then it became one youth rally. And then they were like, cut it off. We don't I mean, need you. Seriously, attending anymore. that is literally, <clears throat> it's, it's what an abusive relationship does. It cuts you off from outside supports. Right. So you've actually been out of that church for a couple of years now. What was your exit like? Were people kind? Did you lose friends? <laughs> you know, was there shunning involved? And I mean, I'm asking this question because I already know, but did the pastor say anything openly about you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So all of that. And it was instantaneous. It was so fast. We, at this time, you know, we hadn't expressed our thoughts or views about like what we were seeing. We're just kind of privately kind of processing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it came to a point where we were both. We, we we couldn't reconcile the issues. The preaching, the manipulation of the, the gifts, violating scripture itself. And on top of that, we were getting burned out. Yeah. I mean, people were dropping left and right as far as like wanting to be participants. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier about like how you use God to excuse yourself from things or not to take accountability. Well, we would always, we were, we were down to like literally for you staff, um, our family, it was like a whole family unit, my wife and her siblings. Yeah. Cause people were like, you know, the Lord has told me my season is done with, with youth ministry. Uh, okay. How can I, how can I deny that then? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a way to get out of it. <laughs> Right. And they say it so beautifully and with tears. And then, you know, uh, we ask people and they're like, I don't feel the Lord has led me to help you. Right. Same for media ministry. People were dropping. I literally only could lean on um, my junior high students. They're the only ones that wanted to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Adults were like, it's beneath me to yeah. do what you do. Yeah. And so. You know, I'm still young at that point. I'm like young and sprightly. I'll, I'll sure I'll burn all these responsibilities and still try to tolerate what I'm hearing. Well, and I mean, you have a life too. Like you have responsibilities in your own personal life on top of all of these obligations at the church. Like you were in school for some of it, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Um, I got my, you know, I, I went through college, got my degree and, um, you know, I put a lot of that stuff on the on the um, side burner when when I was asked to be um, the junior high youth pastor. It, that was everything. And so when you say you had a life, like I was trying to maintain it, but it was it was almost non-existent. We had church on Sunday, and that was a whole ordeal. It's like four to six hours long. And then you're so exhausted Sunday when you finally get out of that. That's it. That was your whole day. Mm -hmm. Monday, we had prayer meeting. Tuesday was free unless we were supposed to meet for like leadership meeting. I was a sound guy. So they would have praise team practice, uh, choir practice. So I had to be there to help with media. Wednesday, we had church. And then before I left, they had an anti-deconstruction um, series, sort of. I think I inspired it because um, <laughs> they, they had the back to the basics series where they would they came to the church and they uh, supposedly taught the taught the apostolic doctrine mm -hmm. to make sure everybody was solidified but only after i had brought up the idea of deconstruction to the church okay so now we have this thursday event and then friday um i'm leading youth mm -hmm. so like as soon as work is over i'm rushing to the church getting prepped setting up for the kids the games the sermon the curriculum the student leadership meeting army saturday you know i'm 
at the church fixing media issues, crawling under the crawl spaces, plugging in cables, dusting out closets, stuff like that. And then Sunday it starts all over again. And at, and at this time, you're also married, you know, trying to be a couple and, and you know, have the connection that a person has in their marriage. And it, it just sounds very busy. It was. It was exhausting. And that was affecting our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I told my wife, because I hated to see what it did to her, because she became... Um, she adopted everything I did. She would, she, she could run that sound system better than anyone I know. Yeah. I could lean on her. She ran the camera system. She did the social media. And at the time we're also developing a social media team, mm -hmm. photography team. I mean, we had no time between each other almost like our time was serving in ministry. That's how we had time. Right. And we had to forego being involved in young married ministry mm -hmm. because our ministries came first. It just came down to a boiling point where like I was literally having anxiety attacks at church. And I know they hear that they would probably downplay and call me like a sissy or a girl or whatever, which is their new thing right now. But I was legitimately like I would tell the staff here, I, I outlined the games, the rules, how to do it. Here are the slideshows. We made like little mini videos for them. Here's when to play it. Mm -hmm. I need to go pray before the sermon and I'll only come out when the sermon comes out. And I was literally hyperventilating in the other room. Wow. Just like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And exhausted my mind out, you know, and, and my wife, she was the same thing. You know, she was in tears often and we were just consoling each other. Like, is this going to go on forever? And so like, my idea was we'll, we'll step down. Mm -hmm. This is not worth our marriage. No. I mean, Oh, not worth your mental health. Right. And I didn't even know that that was something that I should be, you know, protecting because we we were told not that that wasn't oh. a, a consideration. A holy ghost, right? <laughs> mental health, you don't even need to think about it. You just need a good dose of the holy ghost. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Similar sentiments. Uh, and and that's how they addressed it, right? Yeah. And um, you know, I feel bad because the associate pastor I think he observed it and I think he was genuine. I still respect him a lot, even though he he's disavowed me. I look back now, we realize that he was the true pastor. He was the he was the one doing the administrative stuff, making sure all the sub ministries were functioning. He led the leadership disciple meetings. Um, he's the one that checked in with everybody and he, he, he cared about me. the people. Yeah. I told my wife, if, if he had naturally became the pastor, which everyone thought he was going to be the pa the next pastor, I probably would still be in that church today mm -hmm. because I had that much respect for him. But he had given me outs a couple of different times, like two or different, two or three different times. He's like, do you think you can continue to do this or do you feel like you need to step down? And I felt like it was a test of resolve. Right. And I think he, now I look back, I think he was genuinely like concerned. But I took it as a test of resolve. I'm like, no, we're we're stalwart. We're going to keep you know, grinding at this. <laughs> we're going to keep doing this if it kills us. <laughs> yeah. And my wife was upset. She was like, no, we're done. We're exhausted. Yeah. And I was like, no, I, I feel like we need to keep pushing. You know, this is what God wants us to do. And it came down to a point where well, he eventually was sent out, which we think was a political move. Um, and now we don't even have him. Now it's just us. Because the 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 primary pastor, he doesn't meet with people. He's infamous for that. He d he doesn't want to meet with people. So I said, you know what? Now it's time to step down because we can't do this anymore. And we expressed that to the now current associate pastor, uh, which is his daughter. And she was like, "It's not your time to step down yet. I think you're you're going to need you know to talk to the pastor about that." And I was like, "Okay." Sure. And so we were waiting for it to happen and it never happened. He wasn't going to meet with us. And it came down to this, um, you know, again, the backdrop to all this is we're questioning already the this everything that's happening. He calls me out in the service and we were pretty content. Like this is the last weekend we're attending regardless. And um, he he says, Andrew and Laura, come down, come down to the uh, platform. Or I think it was just me. And this is the infamous service where um, 
he said I quote unquote gave him a I was trying to give him a signal because I wore tennis shoes with my suit. <laughs> that was a signal? Apparently. Um, because he accused me of like, I guess having a metrosexual spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's one in the Bible there. You know that one. Yeah, I was like, no, uh, 2003 through 2009 would really love your lingo but um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um he uh he called me down and he didn't have any issues with that at the time he was fine with it and i thought oh he's gonna he's gonna bring me into the office and we'll talk and he just put his arm around me and whispered in my ear he's like you know she told me what y'all said and uh it's not your time uh i need you uh, I think you'll probably need to do this for another seven years. And then maybe we'll talk about, you know, coming on as full-time staff. And I was like, I can't, I can't even do another year. Seven years. And so, and then he just kind of patted me on the back and like, I sent me off and I, and we, before this point, we were like, this is the last service. If he doesn't meet with us, he doesn't meet with us. And mm -hmm. that was probably a godsend. So they gave me keys to the whole church. Like that's how trusted I was because I, I was constantly at the church doing stuff. So we went to the church and I was often going to the church at night to do stuff. I mean, I've slept in the church and that's how often I was working there. Um, we go to the, to my office and um, I, I put my credit card, my keys, everything that was the churches I put on, on my desk. And we prayed in the hallway and my wife and I said, Lord, make this clear and plain to us if this is the right decision to make. And um, I told her my 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 out was that if we were what we were doing was we were testing the spirit. That's what we were saying, like we're testing the spirit, see what will happen. And I left it and we, we bawled our eyes out, cried for like, I don't even remember, just a distinct moment genuine tears just rolling down our faces and we left the church left my keys locked it up so there was no turning back mm -hmm. and um that was a tuesday they had service wednesday and my impression was okay if he reaches out and he tries to have a meeting with us and say hey what's wrong what's going on i tell laura to this day i probably would have folded okay i would have folded if he came to me and said, hey, no, no, you know, everything's going to be OK, blah, blah, blah. But again, we were testing the spirits. We said, God, make it plain to us, make it clear. And that same night, not even a full 24 hour cycle, he calls us and threatens me. Threatens my job. Um, and, you know, I could go more into the story about that. Um, I even have the voicemails where he did because he called me like 18 different times from an unknown number. And we were terrified. And, and he, at the last one, he threatened to come to our house. He's like, if you don't do what's right, I'm going to come to your house and break down your door, come down to your door. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, we were terrified. I, I like literally hold my wife up in our apartment. And I'm like, we're going to call the cops. If he comes here, mm -hmm. I don't care. If I, we're calling the cops and, you know, I'm preparing for any possibility. Needless to say, it was a hard night. <laughs> so he he threatened your job, like your your secular, regular job. He threatened to try to get you fired? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it was all over a simple, like, weird misunderstanding. But the fact that that's what he jumped at. He jumped at threatening my job. Yeah. And they spun it into, like, a weird story. The following day is service. It's Wednesday. And they they had no hesitation. The um, associate pastor, his daughter, preached a sermon, and it was tearing me and my wife down immediately. The whole service was dedicated to, her, to me and her calling my wife a witch, telling them to separate themselves from us. And it wasn't ex this wasn't unexpected. We knew it made sense when he left. And they said, don't talk to them. Don't reach out to them. You're not to reach out to them. They're marked. They're done. And uh, that was it. After that, uh, I had like one friend of mine message me. And then he was like, ah, what happened, man? I want to have coffee with you. And then the following morning, when we were supposed to have coffee. He's like, I thought about it and I prayed about it. And it's probably best that we never talk again. And uh, my best friend in the church that I grew up with, he disavowed me and 
uh, he didn't even try to reach out. He was just, you know, I was the one reach, reaching out to him. And then eventually he came out with it. You know, my extended family, they disconnected from us. You know, there are some still that they won't talk to us. It it hurts. I think this is the level of um, shunning and stuff that people who are in the movement can't fully comprehend. But you leave it and you realize how fickle and how conditional all of your relationships were. And you were sincere in them. Yeah. But you realize other people weren't. Everything was conditional on you thinking exactly like them, staying a member of their church. And that messes you up when you leave. You literally leave and you look at the world differently because you don't trust people. You always assume there's motives. You never fully relax in relationships because you just assume that, you know, there's some hoops you got to jump. And if you stop jumping them, this is over. And I will say myself, I've been out for over 20 years and I still deal with that to this day. I don't trust people. I want to, but you know, when you, when you have a whole community of people turn their back on you, it does a number on you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was the only world we knew, you right. know, and I was, I was devout. I really believed the doctrine. And so, you know, there was people there, uh, people that, you know, they titled themselves themselves this for my own life, but they're like, you know, they were my second mothers. Mm -hmm. They were, um, you know, close friends that they, your family, your family. Yeah. And some people get the, like when I hear people's story leaving the UPC, they, some people give them at least a message. These people, it was just like, just immediate cut. But like, again, we made the decision in less than almost 24 hours, they they never wanted to speak to us again. Yeah, it's like you're dead to them. Yeah. Instantly. And and they did a lot of stuff to try to diminish everything I did at the church. Mm -hmm. Right. And and um, the, as they went as far as to like, you know, um, I made a website for the church, which was like highly praised because it was modernizing from like the old system to the new. And I was pretty proud of it. You know, and that's my background is I'm in technology. So you know, it was natural that I would help them to do that. And I, I had just finished it. It was in, in a good working condition. And then they replaced it. They were like, no, we don't want his website. Yeah. Um, everything I did technologically, they shipped, they changed everything. Uh, then they changed the youth ministry name just to disassociate. And then they, you know, consistently badmouthed me. And mind you, the this blog that I made, mm -hmm. I never intended to come out and make a blog ever. It was never in my mind to do this. I was just going to casually leave the church just like many other people that had before me. Yeah. But there's a way you have to do it. You have to like gradually. And I was like, I don't want to do gradually. I just want to get out without giving a reason. Like so many people can do that. Like you probably know people that you grew up with in your church that just like, you know, it's almost easier. You just start, you know, doing uh, drugs and rock and roll. You can leave and it's fine. Yeah. But if you leave because of doctrinal reasons, you know. If you leave and maintain your faith, you're a heretic. Yeah. But if you leave and just leave faith altogether, well, they look at you warmly because you're still a mission field. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's what I told my wife. I was like, man, maybe we should have just went out and did drugs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would have been an easier, like, then we'd still have people in our lives, you know? Yeah. But yeah, because losing, realized... losing your whole community overnight is huge. Yeah. I mean, family members, like mm -hmm. blood relatives that were just like, you're wrong. We're not going to talk to you anymore. Yeah. Um, to this day. But they don't have the ability to hold a differing opinion and still love you as a person. Yeah. And so... Um, the, the blog didn't come until like a year after, but like, again, I'm, I'm already disentangling a lot of beliefs prior to this move. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm already exposed to like a lot of different teachers, a lot of different like doctrinal church history stuff. Like I started investigating Charles Parham, 
right? You know, the whole apostolic history um, and Azusa Street and yeah. all that stuff. And of course, that could be its whole. I think uh, Michael Haney actually did a um, a really good job of talking about that. Aurelio, um, mm -hmm. keep it in context. And, and then, of course, yourself with all the videos you did uh, over some of those subjects or just in, in the talks that you've done. And then here they are bad mouthing us, slandering our names and telling people like short of like I was doing phot photography and uh, they said, don't do business with him anymore. And it was like interfering with my business now. Mm -hmm. right? Like people that I had been doing pictures for for, for a long time. And it didn't bother me because like I have a primary job, you know, and I can find clients if I need. Um, but it wasn't like a something I leaned on significantly. But it was like, man, he, they're really going out for blood. Yeah. And I mean, the things that they told people were not always one on one. Like a lot of the stuff was said over the pulpit. Yeah. Yeah. To to paint the picture of, of what a horrible person I was. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was like. Uh, these are the same people that like and warmly embraced me, praised me for, you know, like some of these people were there when I was in middle school. And um, it's weird to see them have hold these weird opinions about you. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah, he's always been like, you know, there was something about him. Well, I mean, they have to turn you into the devil, because if they don't, then they have to address your issues yeah and they're not going to do that neither the doctrinal issues nor the issues with the church mm -hmm. so it's just easier to turn you into the devil and they always knew yeah and that's what happened and i was saddened that that people would would believe that especially because i had like one thing that i have with all these people is i had genuine relationships with them i i, I remember having genuine moments with some of these people mm-hmm where we cried together. Yeah. You know, we were there for each other, called each other, texted, and it only took like a one night. Yeah. And it's done. You're you're no good. These clowns out here calling us uh cult. And let me just go on record and say it. And I hope the word get back to him. Andrew Della Rosa and anybody listen to him, you you are a spiritual blockhead. Andrew De La Rosa is a reprobate. And go and tell him that I said it. You can't reason with him. He can talk about God, but he's lost. The minute he put his hand on the Holy Ghost, his mouth, he is a reprobate. And then just look at him. Look how, how it look. And I know people don't like it when I say it. We have some here, you don't like it. You, you, you don't like it when I say something about it because you, you got a little sympathy towards him. Then you think, listen, friend, <laughs> the love of God lead us to repentance. He didn't want to repent. And you can't love somebody that don't want to be loved. And, and sure, I'm going to get up and say, don't, don't try to tell me that we So love doesn't mean you tolerate a lie. Right, 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 right. If you love your children, you're going to tell them the truth. All of that nonsense, spiritualabuse.org, all, all of that stuff, escaping 350, utopia, blog posts, all that stuff. They are, they're just going after anybody associated with Jesus' name. And some people don't have the full truth that they're going after. They're going after anybody. He specifically is trying to come against Bishop Jackson in this church, and it's not working. And I want to remind you of that, that we are in the perfect will of God. God knows exactly what is going on, and judgment has already fallen on that young man. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean that judgment is already there. So we lost everybody. Like we were, It was literally like such a strange feeling to come out. And it's like, it's just me and you. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't even have our family. I mean, my dad, fortunately, and my little brother came out. They left with me. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised that they did because I didn't want them involved in this. I didn't anticipate what would happen happened or what happened to have happened. Um, but my dad was like, nope, we're leaving. We're going with you. That's a help. So I was grateful for that. Yeah, that's amazing.
So obviously you landed in faith still. You're you're still sorting through, figuring out where you land doctrinally on some of these side issues, but you know, you're you're living for God. Mm -hmm. And so I guess last but not least, I will ask you the question that I ask everybody else after everything that you've been through. Are you bitter? Because it is the accusation that gets hurled at every single one of us who leave, who who point out any issues with the organization. I know I can't persuade them that I'm not. Right. <laughs> because I, I didn't leave for any individual. Because even if you disagree with people, you can still have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. As much as I disagree with how people handle things using, like, again, going back to the analogy of the spiritual crutch and the misunderstanding of scripture and abusing scripture in certain ways, I still love those people. Yeah. I still love, um, I mean, one of my family members, I reach out to every Thanksgiving and Christmas and invite them still. And I know they ignore my messages or probably even block them. But I'm never closing the door to any single one of them. I want them to know that. And so it's not about bitterness. Am I hurt? Is it has it been painful? It, it absolutely has been. For sure. Um, it so I definitely wouldn't characterize it as bitter. But again, you know, can I persuade them or not? No, you know, especially now that I have this blog out and these videos, and it's like my whole intention behind the videos is not so that I can do a gotcha on anybody. Right. But to to help people think for themselves, to think critically and to look at the evidence for themselves and come to their own conclusions. Right. And and that's the thing is like these are publicly available videos. Mm -hmm. You can come to your own conclusions watching them without my comments. Right. You know, I'm not like doctoring the footage or anything like that. It's just literally putting it out exactly as it was said. And it's and so it's not coming from a place of bitterness, but coming from a place of like, genuinely, I hope that you start to question it. And I'm open to being persuaded. If you can re if you can see those, co that content and hear yeah. the record that you're hearing, could you come up with solid counter arguments that would persuade me back into the church? I'd be open because I would love for someone to persuade me mm -hmm. to believe in those things. But I know that they don't want to first, but that they, they can't there, unfortunately. So right. that that's my whole intent behind everything. It's just to help open people's eyes and let them come to their own conclusions. Right. You, you're trying to throw a lifeline to people who were in the position you were in with the questions you had at the end of things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And your your pastor is a unique individual. And, you know, some people characterize the UPC as a cult because of its control, um, controlling nature and because of the way they treat people who leave. But I would say if that's the case, then your church and your pastor would have been a cult within a cult. Mm -hmm. It's almost like its own unique um situation that's even more extreme if that's if that's possible than the basic UPCI response to people who leave and so yeah it's a very unique situation but yet probably not entirely there are going to be people who watch this whose churches are just as extreme whose pastors are just as extreme and so I really appreciate you being able to articulated as well as you have and to just come on and lay yourself bare. I mean, this is not easy. People, people watch these videos and are like, oh, you took the easy way out. You're just talking about this because you're looking for attention. It's like, yeah, okay. You have no clue <laughs> how hard all of this is and how much you open yourself up to criticism and attacks from people, sometimes people you love. And yeah. so I just appreciate you being willing to do that, Andrew. And I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing today. Yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share it. Yeah, it is a difficult thing, but I think it's necessary. Um, and I just hope that it helps others. And I hope that people know that, you know, I, there probably will be people that come on to watch critically uh, <laughs> about myself and my story. But to those who 
are genuine and open and sincere. I, I want to be a, a, a resource mm -hmm. to be someone that can pray with you and, and um, be someone that to be of support. You know, I want to be a part of that. And uh, I genuinely love some of the people that com are coming on to be critical. I want them to know that I love them and I still pray for them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I want the best for them as well. That's awesome. Well, if you enjoyed this video, you can hit like, you can share it. And if you'd like for YouTube to let you know when I post a new one, you can subscribe and hit the little notification bell and they will do that. And so leave a comment. <laughs> Even if you're a, a hate follower of my channel and, and a hate watcher of this video, you can still leave a comment. I let most of them through unless they're too nasty or they have profanity in them. <laughs> and so it'll be interesting to see how your church responds to this. So <laughs> anyway, I hope everyone has a great day.